Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that's hot. Oh my goodness, that's hot. Oh, ooh, that's hot. Okay, I, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, I need to put this down. Let's just put this back. Okay. All right, let me just, let me try that again. Hey, hi, hello. Welcome to my corner of booktube. My name is Fats. And uh, I have a lot of very strong opinions, but I fully believe that we're all right at the same time. And if your opinions don't agree with my opinion, that's fine, chill. The point of books is conversation. If we all had the same feelings and the same thoughts, there would literally be no reason to ever talk to another human being. Now, the point of today's video is I read a book and I didn't know what to do with this book, right? It, it was, it was a trip, okay? It was a trip, but like the kind of trip where you're going on a safari and somebody offers that you go on an ostrich safari and then you get the ostrich that has one leg and then you get chased by a pride of lions, you know? It's kind of like that. Like in theory, this is a great and amazing thing, you know, going on a safari, seeing Africa, but because you've got a one-legged ostrich and now you're being chased by lions, it's not something you would recommend somebody else do, you know? Does that make any sense? It made sense to me. But, okay, better example, because this is, it was a romance. So let's imagine the Titanic, right? Jack and Rose fighting over that last door, okay? And then that door goes off the side of Niagara Falls. That is what this is like. In theory, there are feelings. In theory, there are moments. And, you know, and because I respect your TBR, I don't want to tell you to go read it. And I don't want to put it on like a wrap up and then you're like, oh, that sounds like she that sounds like she had a good time. When I kind of didn't. And because I respect your TBR, I don't want to mislead you and I want to respect your time. All in all, I'm gonna tell you what it's about. This is You Again by Kate Goldbeck. Contemporary romance, enemies to lovers type of deal. You'll figure it out, you'll see. I have notes because I wanted to give you the full picture. I wanted to give you all the full things. Did I like introduce that properly? Did I say my name? Yeah, I said my name. I guess let's just jump right in. My tea finally cooled off. Earlier, I was fighting for my life against this tea. I'm trying to cut down on how much coffee I drink and I'm trying to become a tea girly. Yeah, I am fighting for my life. Now, this book opens up with Ariana Sloan. Ari is a struggling comedian that moved to the big city with barely any money in her pocket, hoping to make it make or break in the entertainment community. And right now, just to pay her bills, she's canvassing and just trying to hit quota to rescue the bobcat. She's out on the streets, she's got a sign, she just needs people to sign up and make a donation. She bumps into a man. And this man just completely ruins her day because he's rude, he's on his phone, and she just starts to refer to him as tall nightmare sweater guy. That's just who she, he is, just another rude guy in New York. And that's where we're at. Ari has this closet type of apartment. She's got not really much going for her. She hooks up with this guy named Gabe. She has a roommate named Nat. Like it's just New York. When you don't have money money, you know, when you have normal people money. Yeah, New York isn't fun for normal people money. So anyway, Ari finally gets home, she finishes that day, she doesn't hit quota, and she just calls Gabe over. Gabe is another comedian type of guy. Sorry, there's more to talk about. Gabe is just another guy struggling in New York, another comedian, he's had a few more gigs than Ari, so he does kind of act as a mentor occasionally. And Gabe and Ari hook up. 
Now, one thing you're going to learn about Ari is all Ari wants is no attachment sex, right? She just wants to have a good time, send people on their way. She doesn't stay over because spending the night and cuddling, that, that's where feelings start. So she likes something casual. Gabe is perfect for that. Her and Gabe, they're hooking up, and then suddenly the doorbell buzzes. And Ari's like, oh yeah, that's, I, that doesn't have anything to do with me. But then Natalie texts Ari and she's like, hey, you know that guy that I'm kind of hooking up with? Um, yeah, he's coming over to cook me dinner. And Ari's kind of floored because she has this budding crush on her roommate, Natalie. And so the last thing she wants is to meet somebody else that's sleeping with Natalie. But what is she gonna do, leave this guy outside? So she lets him up. She lets this guy up, his name is Josh, whatever, he's a chef. And she and him immediately butt heads because it's Tall Nightmare Sweater Guy, that guy from earlier that was rude to her when she was canvassing to save the Bobcats. Same guy, sleeping with Natalie. So of course they immediately don't like each other. And as they're talking, because you know, they're strangers and strangers immediately get into each other's like philosophies of life. Um, they find out that he's a bit of like a planned romantic, I would say. Like he sees the future and then he has these steps and then I'm gonna propose and it's gonna be beautiful and everything's perfect and I'm gonna say I love you and then everything's gonna be fantastic. He's that guy. And Ari is of course the no feelings, just a good time. So they do kind of spat about that. They cook the meal together a little bit. They have a little bit of a back and forth. And then as it comes closer that Natalie is gonna come, Ari self-destructs and she throws it in Tall Nightmare Sweater Guy's face that they are both sleeping with the same woman and maybe he should stop referring to Natalie as his girlfriend because she's obviously not his girlfriend if she's sleeping with her roommate, right? And so Ari's literally like, well, if you were satisfying her so much, she wouldn't be crawling to me now, would she? End scene. Three years later, Ari may have just landed a good gig, you know? You, you've gone forward in time. And Ari is texting her best friend, Radia, that she may have finally gotten an opportunity. She's hype, she's excited, she's gonna go visit Radia at her, the restaurant that she works at. Meanwhile, Radia is in the weeds. She's got a head chef that has this annoying type of menu concept. He has given her instructions and she said that due to the fact that the lamb is a little bit um, colder and that her oven isn't working quite the way that it should, that she's gonna need to cook it a little bit longer and that plate time is gonna take a little bit longer. And he gets in her face and he's like, I know what I'm doing, this is my dish and you're gonna cook it how long I say. And she's like, hey, respectfully, I do know how to do my job, okay? I'm gonna cook it the amount that I want. And he's like, respectfully, you're gonna to listen to me. Ari shows up while Radia and her head chef are arguing. She sits at the bar, she says whatever. When Radia is done with whatever she's doing, she can come and they can catch up, right? Um, Ari is very protective of Raja. She's going through a divorce. That's kind of how they met. Raja was going through something and Ari had moved in with her and they really connected so quickly over what Raja was going through. Um, Ari's waiting at the bar. She's talking to the cute bartender. She's saying things oh, overtly sexually. And Raja comes walking out and she's like, Ugh, just tell me what's going on. I've had such a long day. And... Uh, in the corner of their eyes, they see a lamb plate being walked out to a major food reviewer. They cut open the lamb and it's raw. So you know, Josh comes out like this. It's raw, Melissa. Yes, chef. It's raw, come on. Yes, chef. And Raja comes back at him because Raja's sick of this all of these privileged white men and she's a brown woman just trying to make it in the food world she's not going to get spoken to like this that's just quite honestly not going to happen on her watch so she's yelling at this man this chef is yelling at her 
Ari is just kind of like trying to focus on just starting with the bartender. She's not going to step into that. That's obviously not her place. Out of the corner of her ear, she hears the head chef shout at Raja that she's fired. So Ari stands up and splashes him in the face with her drink. And as the liquid is dripping down her face, who is it? Tall Nightmare sweater guy, Josh. The guy that was sleeping with her past roommate? Yeah, that one. End scene. Two more years go by. It is now 2019. We started this in 2014. It is now 2019. It's New Year's Eve. Josh is in a long distance relationship. She's a go-getter. She's Her name is Sophie. Sophie's cool. Sophie's just very driven and she's pursuing her career. So they've just done long distance so that they can both focus on their careers as it's going. Josh, in the meantime, he has gotten his father's restaurant, which is really known for like its sandwiches and its chopped cheese. And Josh has taken it over and he's excited to be giving it like a rebrand, a, a fresher, more gourmet feel. Um, and his sister, since he's in this long distance relationship with Sophie, Josh's sister is like, hey, let's go to a party. Let's get out. One of my professors is throwing a thing. You're gonna love it. It was my film professor. Like it's gonna be a fantastic time. And Josh is like, okay, but like I'm going home early. If I see that you're you're making moves on a nice young gentleman, I'm gonna go. And she's like, oh, as you should, because I'm not riding back with you and a nice young gentleman. So they get there. Josh is kind of flitting about. He meets this film professor, whatever her name is, Cass. Cass is one of those people that just has to be the center of attention. And then in strides a woman. And Cass is like, oh, you guys, look at, it's my wife. It's Ari. And Ari, Ari's a little twisted. And so she's looking and she's like, don't I know you? And Josh is like, nah, you, no. What? No, me? After a bit of an awkward introduction and interaction, the party starts going. Josh isn't really feeling it. So he decides to quickly sneak upstairs and send like a very sexy voice message to his long distance girlfriend, right? He had sent her some lingerie in the mail and he's like, hey, you better send me pictures. Like he's, he's getting spicy over the phone into that voicemail. Like he's in it. Once he gets all into that, he hangs up and then in pokes a head from the fire escape and it's Ari and she's like, well, that was, that was intense. <laughs> And he's like, oh, you heard that? And they kind of catch up. He's like, he's like, oh, I've noticed that you've grown. That's crazy. Um, when we had first met that very first time when I had come over to cook dinner, we were talking about how you never wanted to get into a relationship, how that you were somebody who just wanted something casual and how if you don't get too serious with anybody, then you can't possibly disappoint them later on. And she was like, yeah, I guess I've grown. And she said that in this time, she noticed that she likes that Cass just wants her. Having somebody that wants you and sees you as first and looks at you with so much love is exactly what she wanted. The countdown happens and Josh's car comes and he's like, oh, time for me to go. I'll see ya. And see. Another time jump. Now this is the last major time jump. You get another three year time jump. We're now in 2022. Ari is going through a divorce. Cass had offered that they go through a little open marriage type of thing. Cass said that she didn't want to be tied down by the heteronormative conceptions of a monogamous relationship and that to love is to love anybody and everybody and that she didn't want to be held in by restrictions and boundaries that were not defined by her herself, you know? You know, the, the type of things that you learn in your first femme fill class? Yeah, that's what Cass was out here spinning. Which like, go you girl. So Ari had kind of gone along with that. And then there was a point where Cass had met somebody 
packed up all their her things from the apartment and said, hey, I kind of like like another person like a lot. And I know like I'm doing this non-monogamy thing, but like I kind of want to do the monogamy thing with her instead, I think. And just leaves Ari. So Ari's at Cream Pot. It's a little bit of a sex shop. She's just trying to find something, I don't know, to fill the void or whatever. She's with Raja, her best friend. And meanwhile, outside the shop, Josh is walking past and he goes, oh, I do need some more skincare. This place called Cream Pot is obviously a skincare spot. So he walks in and literally bumps into Ari. And Ari goes, hey, you're, you're Tall Nightmare Sweater Guy. And, the, and he's like, yep. Josh, Josh is my name. And they kind of catch up. They, and again, it's one of those like unrealistically honest kinds of conversations because Ari's like, I'm going through a divorce and everything is hard. And Josh is like, my life is hard. And then so Ari is like, do you want to, do you want to like go get it, like hang out and talk? Like, do you want to talk about this? And Josh is like, yeah, like let's go get a drink. Like that's, Let's catch up. And they talk. You know, they talk. And Ari basically says that she wanted somebody to, I wrote it down. She wanted a friend in misery. And she finally found a person that she can just be miserable with. So her and Josh build up this kind of friendship. The next like 150 pages of the book is their friendship. They go to like Ikea together. They get up this hobby of watching movies over the phone because Ari said she can't watch movies with anybody in person because it's basically euphemistic for her to watch a movie. And she hasn't even gotten past the first 14 seconds. You know, one of those. So they watch movies over the phone because Ari's like, I don't know if I should like come into your place and like watch movies because you know, I don't understand. Um, so they do that, right? That's kind of their friendship. They bond, they banter, or they do stuff together. They're miserable together, okay? 150 pages of that. There's like a couple of funny scenes. Like there's an, for example, there's a scene where Josh is on a date and it's going horribly and he texts an SOS to Ari and Ari busts in and she pretends to be like an upset wife who just found her husband cheating. It's one of those that's just friendship stuff, right? Check two, like I'm, I'm skipping a lot because the friendship stuff isn't really exciting. It was actually kind of hard to get through all the friendship stuff. Um, Ari's still struggling with comedy. Josh hasn't been cooking ever since. Oh wait. Oh yeah, by the way, Josh's restaurant failed. So he has to like, he has to get rid of his father's restaurant. He doesn't know what to do about that. So they're both not having a good time. 150 pages a lot. In the midst of all of this friendship stuff, right? There's a scene where Josh has to go to, he has to go to a family function type of thing. He is losing his dad's restaurant and his, because that his gourmet idea didn't just, just didn't work out. And he needs just somebody to be there with him. So of course it's the Ari comes with him. They're there, he says some words, they do a dance. But Ari has this thing where she gets a panic attack where she's around romantic situations. So just before the countdown, she's like, can we go somewhere? I don't want to be here for the countdown. I don't want to be here seeing all these people kissing. I can't handle it. I'm going to have one of my attacks. Um, they go to the park. They're walking around. Josh tells her, like, this is the park where my brother always wants to do this run thing or whatever for New Year's. And uh, countdown happens. And they kiss. And sparks fly, right? Sparks are flying. Things are happening. Things are great. And then Ari shuts down. She shuts down and she immediately throws out the framework. She throws it in his face and she's just like, yeah, honey. So Josh is just kind of like, okay, whatever, honey. They take some distance, whatever. Ari's kind of avoiding Josh. That happens for another like 30 pages or whatever. So then at this point, Raja has a pop-up. She's been working on establishing herself as her own chef and not working underneath a white man, right? And so Ari has been avoiding Josh to such a degree that Josh is like, 
asks his sister, he's like, hey, do you want to go to a pop-up and see what's going on? They go to Raja's pop-up, see what's going on, and Ari's there. And it's one of those situations where like it's kind of awkward. Everybody makes jokes like, oh, hey, here, your boyfriend's here. And they kind of just snap. They're just kind of like, this isn't my boyfriend. We're not like that. And it's just like awkward. So Josh is, she's hurt. So he's like, I'm just going to go, okay? If you're screaming at people that you don't like me like that, like that's a little awkward for me. I'm gonna peace out. And she's like, hold on, wait. And she chases after him and Josh is like, you've been avoiding me. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they have this scene where Josh is like, either we do this or we don't do this. And then she's like, what am I gonna do? And then he like pulls her onto the train. They go back to his place, sex scene, right? I, I've got some things to say about this sex scene, mind you. So this whole book Ari's going on about how she likes using toys in the bedroom and how penetrative sex doesn't really do it for her, right? And then suddenly with Josh, she's like, wow. You're the first person to ever make me feel this way in this position and doing this thing. My body composition and the way that I receive pleasure has completely changed because you are so good at what you do. Ew. There's also this really awkward moment where Ari is trying to like make the entire situation not romantic and she's like, let's go do it on the Bowflex. Um, or um, this isn't romantic, let's go do it on the on the, on the table over here. Or um, I don't want to make eye contact with you, so let's do it this way. And Josh is like, no, let's do missionary. Like it's so it's just it made me so uncomfortable to witness Ari Ari's character being like, I don't want to connect with you at all, so I'm going to turn my back and I only want to have my back turned and wow. And then in the morning being like, wow, I've never, that eye contact stuff, I haven't done that for years. Like, wow. Oh, like that, I was so uncomfortable during the sex scene and we're just not going to talk about it past how uncomfortable I was and how Josh is just so fantastic and he completely changed her mind and showed her that pleasure is so expansive and maybe she's just, ugh. Ugh. Oh yeah, where were we? They wake up in the morning. Ari's freaking out. Because she doesn't sleep over, remember? And then Josh rocks her world again, and in the middle of the morning world rocking, Ari says, I love you. And Josh is like, <laughs> ew. And then she disappears, storms off, doesn't want to talk about it. Josh freaks out, he's texting everybody. It's just kind of their moment. It's just kind of what's happening. Ari just kind of sets a boundary. She's like, I said a thing, and I think I just kind of need some space right now. And Josh is understanding. He says, okay, whatever, take your space. I get it. You said a thing, and that thing happened. And it goes on later down the line, a few days pass, and then Josh comes to help Ari pack up her apartment. Cass is like, hey, you just need to get out of here. Um, my broker will get in contact with you. They're helping pack. And we get the third act conflict. I marked the page, literally page 311, you get the third act conflict. And uh, here's the scene. She looks exhausted. I don't want to get lost in someone else. I need to do something with my own life. They're having an argument because she's like, hurt people don't fall in love. And he's like, hurt people can fall in love. And he responds back. What the heck do you think my life is like? He stands up again, needing the higher ground, pacing in a tight circle. I'm a complete failure. My dad worked himself to death for 40 years, keeping his business afloat for my sister and I, and I killed it in a matter of months. Every morning I wake up and remember that I failed him in every way possible and it's too late to repair it. I have no job, no friends, and I make up a bunch of stupid bullshit to do until it's time to go to sleep and do it all over again. Do you realize the only thing I look forward to every hecking day is talking to you? That's exactly why this won't work, she says. You failed one time and you act like this pathetic victim of circumstance. Nothing's stopping you from trying again except your own ego. No one exiled you and I don't want to be the only person you can talk to. I don't want you to take care of, you to take care of me. I'm an adult. And then he responds, since when? Seems to me that you'd rather be nipple piercings and bong vapor. They fight. She then gets a job across town. <sighs> Her and her friend make up, she's feeling lonely, she 
some months pass and then she discovers that she left all the people she cares about and she really misses them and then she quits that job. That all happens, it's like five months, another 50 pages of waste. She comes back. It's New Year's Eve. Her and Rajya have a heart to heart. And Rajya's like, girl, like, you were there for me all throughout my divorce and then you're too prideful to let me be there for you and you wouldn't show me a side of yourself and you relied on this man to be a support for you and you just wouldn't talk to me and she's like and you built this whole connection with Josh and I just kind of sat here wanting to be that person for you and they make up it's cute it's fantastic and then Raja does like a girl go get your man He's running at the park right now. So Ari sprints, she gets to the park, she sees Josh and she's like, Josh. And Josh is about to get, like start the race. And he's like, and he starts running. And then he texts her and he's like, can't believe you think you can just show up like that. And then Ari's like, Josh, please. And he's like, you think this is a joke? And then he turns around in the race. He's wading through the people and Ari's standing on the sidelines and she sees him and she's like, and it's too loud. They can't quite talk and she's texting him and she's like, I planned a whole speech for you. I planned a whole speech and I just, please, I feel lonely and I miss you. And Josh goes, well, let's hear that speech then. All that, this whole speech is over text. Sometimes I say ridiculous things just so you get this really specific look on your face where you're kind of annoyed but mostly amused and it gives me more joy than making people laugh. You do this thing with your mouth when you're deciding what to say next and I find it really hot and I never told you that. I get this Pavlovian smile response every single time I get a text from you even if it's just one word because you still make me a little nervous and excited. I want to give you shit about the, cl the clown costume forever. It'll never get old for me. I want to buy organic grapes for you. I want to bring you chicken noodle soup when you're sick. I want to wear your shirts. I want to take your shirts off me. I want you to take your shirts off of me and whisper dirty things in my ear. I want to wake up to your voice every morning and fall asleep to it every night. I build my entire life around not needing anyone, but I need you. I'm sorry it took me so long to let myself believe that. I don't know if these are the right words to make you believe in it too because I'm not healed. Sorry, there's a truck, wow. Because I'm not healed yet. My existential wound is still bleeding and it might be too late, but you said there is never going to be a perfect time. So I'm here now saying that we deserve to be happy. Maybe there's no such thing as soulmates, but I think you're my person and I'm yours and I don't want to wait for it anymore. I want to wake up with you in the morning tomorrow. They kiss, it's cute, happily ever after her. And a year later, he proposes. Whatever, the end. Woohoo. <sighs> this was a story about codependence and trauma bonding. Like, what are we talking about here? This is not romantic. You guys both need to work on yourselves and heal. And they're like, I need friends in misery. We need to work on it together. We can connect. He's the one person I could talk to. I need you, I need you. I can't do anything without you. You're the only person I want to talk to. This is codependence. This is codependence and trauma bonding, and that is a horrible foundation to build a relationship on. Also, also, nobody has gotten over anything. You know, it's like nobody's dealt with the bad things. It's like I'm hurting, and we can do, we can hurt together still. That is what you guys built your friendship on, and you can't build a relationship off of that. I do like how the book started. I do like how the book started. The way that this enemies version of like an enemies to friends to lovers was built up was cute. Raja deserves better. Honestly, Raja deserves better because why was Ari befriending the man that fired her and got all up in her face and almost ruined her career? That's the book. That's what happened. That's the book that I just quite simply didn't want you to read because the only way you're going to read it is if it's like this because this book is red flag after red flag after red flag and then tied up in a little bow and then you like squint your eyes a little bit and then you think it's a present that's that's what this is you think it's romance and the author had this cute little 
love confession in a text message? What is the beginning of the book set up the perfect like meet cute after meet cute after meet, well bad meet cute after bad meet cute. And the concept of them becoming friends was cute and could have been great. But the fact that we are confusing codependence for love is wild to me. It's like, it's like we all just stopped watching Oprah and just forgot that, that healthy relationships exist. Um, that, was, that was the ride that I went on and I'm so glad that I got to share that with you. I didn't want to put it in a video when you'd be like, oh, LOL. I want to read that. Don't waste your time. Don't do it. I felt so uncomfortable with Ari constantly trying to make things not romantic and Josh constantly guiding her to something that's not like supportive and it's not like cute. And it also felt weird that Josh was like, oh, she's going to get a romance panic attack. Let me make sure that I remove her from all romantic spaces but then try to guide her into romance. Like everything about this made me so very uncomfortable. <sighs> also, like, are we not gonna talk about how Ari was like, I can never come over to your house and watch a movie because I just don't know how and the next thing I know you're gonna be naked. Like, no, consent is cool, you know? <laughs> like, uh, um, it was like a, a good really bad time but like I like laughed a few times I don't know I respect your TBR I wasn't gonna tell you to read it I wasn't gonna put it in a wrap-up I didn't want to put it in a good book I didn't necessarily want to put it in a bad book I didn't know what to do with this book thank you for third person reading it through me I hope like I don't know I don't even I don't even care if I like got it across well because the disjointed nature of all of this jumping in time and as well as all of the, um, you also jump point of view. So the POV jumping, the time jumps, the time skips, the, the way that the spaces weren't built around these characters and you were POV jumping and maybe they were in the same space but you would POV jump in this, it was just, it was a lot. It was kind of bad, but like, it was a trip. I'll see you next time. Since this was such like kind of a negative video, I think I'm gonna film like a February favorite. So stay tuned for a February favorites video. I will be filming that next because I did have some pretty fun reads this February and I'm excited to share them with you. Um, I hope you're taking care of yourself. And if you're not, that's okay too. And until next time. Oh, I have the hiccups. <laughs>